Hey, I'm Sabby. I'm a music journalist. I've been in this line of work for a little over 20 years, and there are things I've seen that trouble my conscience. That I will no longer be silent about. This video is in response to the Pitchfork GQ merger specifically, but it's about a lot more than that. I feel that in the Pitchfork GQ merger and in the response to that merger from many of my peers, we have an opportunity to open up a long overdue conversation that needs to be had with urgency. It is urgent that we roll our sleeves up and have an honest conversation about the impact that music critics in particular have had in larger um, wind patterns of uh, um, public discussion. And this is a message for pretty much everyone in my field and in media generally, and people who follow music journalism and people who follow media. So, so pretty much everybody, critics, their editors, their publishers, bloggers, content creators on YouTube, executives making decisions on, on, you know, these, all these moving parts and fans, uh, you know, music fans, the public, <laughs> and then people who are in other branches of media as well. If you've had any interface or contact or engagement with that entire universe, this is for you. Now, I want to make clear that what you're about to see and hear, it's not meant to be a personal attack. There are moments, although I have tried to keep my tone from boiling over into like outright antagonism because it's, that's not effective. There are times when I get really fired up and I would ask that you try to take to heart what I'm saying, even if you think I'm being a dick about it. Again, nothing I say here is personal. I don't know you. And if I did, I can pretty much guarantee you that I would find some way to establish common ground and to like you as a person. I have, uh, shall we say, particular thoughts on the whole premise of music criticism and art criticism to begin with. You will hear those, and to some, it will be confounding as to, wait a minute, wait a minute, how the fuck does this guy justify writing music reviews and getting paid and then turn around and say he's not a critic he's not one of them that is as far as i'm concerned the lesser important issue here that's not the the real issue and whatever i might say about your vocation is kind of immaterial whether i think music criticism is legitimate or not it doesn't matter it's still happening and there's still an audience for it. There's still an appetite for it. There's still a market for it. And nothing I say is going to make you stop what you're doing anyway. So who cares? However, in the bigger picture where my profession is rife with moralism, with a rush to castigation, a rush to like openly combat freedom of speech, and I wouldn't say increasingly because it's been, it's just been what it is, but a, a, a very dogmatic moral code that functions much the same way like religious dogma function. The time is now to put, you know, pull the plug on all of that. And, you know, for me, this is difficult because although it will sound otherwise, at times, it's not in my nature to be directly confrontational. A lot of my friends will be like, that's total bullshit. 
<laughs> like that's wrong. This dude is totally argumentative. He's pig headed, gets all in your face and fired up and really self-righteous, self-important. Like all those things have been condescending, right? These are from my friends. Generally speaking though, I don't like to just bound into like a, a contentious arena without really thinking things through and trying my best to be discreet about it first. It's also difficult because I value the relationships I've formed in the process of doing this work. Like I care about the people who I work with. Even though some of those relationships will undoubtedly be damaged by what I'm saying here. I do care. Those relationships are and will continue to be important to me regardless of how they shake out from this point on. It is my belief that the unacceptable trends in music journalism have developed at the and have been driven at the hands of people who want to be decent and do the decent thing. It becomes very tricky when you want to let someone know that you think their intentions or in spite of their best intentions that what they've done is wrong. And, you know, there's a temptation to kind of just be polite, be diplomatic, allow people to sort of go where they're going and not cause a lot of friction. That's not entirely why I've been silent the last 10 years. A lot of it is because I feel like I haven't been restricted from saying what I want to say in the context of music reviews. I don't like to be, um, what's the word? A polemical maybe? I don't, I don't like to um, be didactic in my writing. So I haven't felt limited or muzzled. But I'm, I, I can't in good conscience be silent anymore. And all of the people that I'm addressing, and there are moments where it, it gets real, like, huh, <laughs> right? Um, all of, to all of you that I'm addressing, even some that I mentioned by name, I understand you've, you've been trying to do the right thing. I must point out to you that you haven't been doing the right thing. And so this requires a balance of um, understanding, diplomacy, tact, but also bluntness and firmness. All of the people in my profession, in my opinion, must be told no in a particular way about a, a rampant presumption that has hijacked and captured music journalism. Someone needs to say no. Someone needs to stand up and say, enough. That's enough. So here we go. I understand this shot looks like shit. I understand... There's going to be lots of things you can make fun of. I don't care. I don't care if people are like, oh my God, this person sounds unhinged. Like, you know, he's having, like, he's like spiraling and can't stay on topic and blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't give a fuck about that. What I do care about is that the people in my profession, from the grunts doing the work on the ground all the way up to the decision makers at the top, need to put a stop to what's been going on. There is a, 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 an ethical obligation to turn the ignition on this, like, um, runaway train that has, you know, been barreling down the track for a decade plus. Mowing down everything in its path. We need to slow this down, reel it in, and reconsider. 
what we have been saying and what we have been doing. And, you know, the irony here is that music critics have spent a lot of energy scolding or uh, um, casting aspersions at or even just challenging artists for the destructive power of their words while not being conscious at all of the destructive power we have with our words. I'm going to repeat that. Over the last 10 years, music journalism has been a haven for sounding alarm bells about the supposedly destructive or even quote-unquote dangerous aspects of what artists have said of their words, while at the same time, music critics have not been conscious of the power of their words. And so I am going to attempt to outline what that power is and the effect that it's had, and in my view, the, the extremely harmful effect that it's had. This is not personal. I don't want you to feel personally attacked by what I'm saying. I want, I would ideally love for you to just consider the ideas that I'm putting in front of you. And to try to separate, to try to sort of depersonalize it. You'll notice my clothes will change. Yes, it looks like I just woke up, which I didn't today. The camera's going in and out of focus. There's lots of things, right, like that are obvious. Nevertheless, I hope you'll take stock of what I'm saying and try to take it to heart. Okay, so several days ago at the moment I'm taping this, news came down that Pitchfork is being absorbed into GQ magazine. Pitchfork, the at one point, the most influential music blog slash website ever. Or, uh, yeah, blog website. Uh, one of the most iconic and influential name brand music outlets. You know, prior to Pitchfork, in the age of print magazines, there was Rolling Stone and a bunch of other print magazines. And once the blog age really took off in the early 2000s, Pitchfork became the leading voice in music criticism. I wrote for Pitchfork. I freelanced and wrote mostly music reviews, a little over 100. Uh, three essays and a handful of I don't I don't even know maybe like three two track reviews or news items for Pitchfork between uh, December of 2014 through November of 2017 so it was almost three years. When the news of the Pitchfork GQ merger broke <clears throat> was announced by Anna Wintour, who some of you may recognize from the documentary film about her. And also she's the character that inspired The Devil Wears Prada. She is a publishing, I don't know, giant icon. She's an executive at Condé Nast, which is the, the, the publishing company that bought Pitchfork in 2015 and is also in charge of GQ. They, they own Vogue, which Anna Wintour is the editor-in-chief of. Uh, GQ... Glamour, Wired, and others, like Condé Nast Traveler. When the announcement was made, this predictably, and to some degree, you know, it's understandable, sparked an outcry among music journalists, editors, music media, entertainment media people. There were, there have been a bunch of think pieces on it. Uh, and several musicians also, like people around music, but but musicians, artists, have also talked about how this is a shame because, you know, there are fewer and fewer outlets. Well, it's not just the artists saying this, but one of the things I, I've heard a bunch of times is, you know, where are up and coming artists? What uh, What avenues do they have to get exposure now? Because Pitchfork often championed or at least covered, <laughs> didn't know always champion, but covered lesser known music. 
So I tweeted in response to that, you know, I guess you could say a, a pretty blunt counterpoint, but I wanted to explain, not walk it back at all, but just give you the full picture of where I'm coming from. But the first thing I have to say is I am not disgruntled. I believe it or not, had an overwhelmingly positive experience working with the folks at Pitchfork. I was almost never like steered into saying things that I wasn't comfortable saying. I never felt like my voice was compromised. I never felt like they like contrived, like they had decided what they wanted to say about a certain artist. So then picked me because they thought I would carry out like I never thought that they behind closed doors, although I wouldn't know, but I never felt like they um, were like, oh yeah, this new hip band, we want to give them a good review. So can you do that? There's never that. Never, ever, ever, ever. And a lot of the time, <laughs> one of the editors would approach me and because of the way I write, I'd be like, oh, what do you think of so-and-so? And I'd be like, yeah, I think it's blah, 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 blah. And then I fucking totally changed my mind and submit copy, which was not what I said. My impression was the first time, and they were cool with it. They were also extremely patient. I mean, I was like shocked at how patient they were. Because I am nitpicky. I'm always late on deadlines. I'm horrible with deadlines. On top of that, I'm nitpicky. I ask to change things after the fact all the time. Like, oh, wait, 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 I just noticed that word. I'm like, that, that person. Right. Then that, you know, once everything is set and done, ready to go, say, like, oh, I just noticed this can kill me. And they're like, dude, like most outlets are like, no, no, it's out there. You have to stop. But where they were super, super patient, I would submit my copy, then they would edit my copy and send it back to me with like a bunch of editors copied on the on the chain. And then they would let me edit their edits and then they would re-edit based off of my edits. And I'm like, God damn, like who has the time for that? Right. Cranking out all this content. They did. They did. They were great about it. And so the harsh tone of my tweet thread would indicate that I view Pitchfork from a disparaging perspective. I needed to say what I said because I think there's a bigger story here, but I have to say this. The overwhelming majority of the editors I've worked with have been a joy to work with. Jason Green at Pitchfork and Jeremy Larson as well. Just wonderful people to work with and other editors I've worked with as well. Scott Russell and several others at Pace that I've worked with along the way, including Matt Mitchell there currently. I mean, there's too many people to name here. I imagine those people, uh, J.J. Skolnick, formerly Jess Skolnick, Zoe Camp at Bandcamp, and Zoe Camp also worked as an editor at Pitchfork, edited some of my stuff there as well. You know, I imagine that a lot of them will feel kind of hurt or maybe not hurt. They might not care that much what I think, but they'll be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where the fuck is this coming from? Like, we've been, you've been in this sphere for such a long time like we've never heard this from you it might sound like a traitor in their midst and that does concern me because i do value these relationships and i don't want anything that i say here to come across even to people i don't know as like like this like antagonistic you know big giant vomit stream of judgment and disapproval and anger. However, how do how do how does one say these things to people I care about in a way not only that um, takes their feelings into account, but also is more likely to be heard, right? It, 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 like in a way that doesn't instantly put up people's defenses with like, oh, well, that guy sounds like somebody who watches Tucker Carlson or somebody like that. You know, I've gotten that before, which is very odd. 
considering where my politics actually are, I'm probably the last person one would expect to, like, I'm not, where I'm coming from sociopolitically is not at all in line with the stereotypes one might knee-jerk reach for in hearing some of the things I'm saying. I think people are conditioned to automatically hear certain points and consign you to like a dry erase board where there's two columns and there's two sort of cartoon views. We're all bombarded so much with media that encourages us to other people to like to engage in this othering that we're in a fog, right? We like, I'm trying to get certain things across with some measure of nuance and grace. I'm trying, <laughs> trying. On the one hand, I am, to say I'm argumentative is, is like an understatement. There's a, there's an aspect just in my wiring that not only enjoys, but it seems to need, seems to require arguments more dominant though, or more, or, um, there's a, there's a, there's another as part of me that is much more keen on making connections first. I much prefer discretion. I'm like that in my writing. I'm like that about my musical opinions, right? Like if you come up to me and you're like, oh, I love, I don't know, the song Idiotech by Radiohead. It's a song I happen not to like. I will very often just not even let on that I don't like that song. I don't feel the need to. It's not because I want you to like me. It's because I'm not going to piss on your trip. And if you're like, oh, idiotech, blah, 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 and blah, I'm going to keep asking you questions, most likely, to get you talking about what, what it is you love about that thing, whatever you're talking about. And rarely will I say, well, actually, I don't respond. I mean, almost never will I argue and be like, well, blah, 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 this is the real thing that you should like, blah, blah, blah. That's just a moronic way of engaging on music. Now, if you're a really good friend of mine, then I take the gloves off and I turn into a complete prick and I'll do that to rib you because I really like you. But even then, that's fucking rare. Right? So I don't push my view of mu or my opinions of music on you, even in my reviews. There is criticism in my reviews. But that's, I'm not speaking to you, taking it for granted that you agree with me. If you come up to me and you're like, man, I love Bob Dylan, or I love the Beat Poets, people I'm not really a fan of, although I'm coming around on Dylan. Um, slowly, but I am. But so what? Or um, <clears throat> I love this culture critic. I'm not going to just be like, well, I don't like that person. <laughs> You know, the, 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 the analogy that always comes to me is like, if someone, if you were sitting in a booth at a restaurant and you're like, oh my God, I love this so much. It's so delicious. And someone walks by your table and vomits on the, the, what you're eating or farts on your table really loud and disgust in a disgusting way on purpose, points their ass at what you're eating. Right? That's unpleasant. <laughs> like, who would want that? Or, even if they liked what you're liking, but then started, like, being really, like, professorial about what it is you're eating, you're like, can I have my fucking taste buds back, please? Like, who the fuck asked you? And so, I look at music as this infinite universe and music transports you like a spaceship or like astral travel to anywhere in that universe you want to go. And so if you're floating above the rings of Saturn 
And you're like, wow, man, this is like the most, man, the most transcendent thing. I'm seeing God. And then Sabby comes along. And I get in your spaceship and start making a lot of fucking noise. I don't blame you for being like, you need to leave. (laughs) So that's the perspective I write from where I don't want to intrude on you. The way I've always pictured what I do is I'm just a person behind the counter at an ice cream shop. You come in and either you express interest that you're looking for something and you're kind of curious and looking through the, 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 you know, the glass case. And I have little spoons and I go, oh, have you tried this? That's it. I'm not like, oh, you shouldn't like rum raisin because it sucks. I'm like, oh, you like rum raisin? You might like this. The other thing I like to say, which may sound pretentious, is I'm trying to make art about art. That's what I'm aspiring to. It's very important to me to write something where the artist feels um, like someone tried to get into their shoes of where they were coming from. That, to me, is the ultimate compliment, or one of the ultimate compliments. Right, so when an artist says, wow, you really, you really got where I was coming from. That's one. The other ultimate compliment is when someone goes out and pursues something I wrote about, even though I didn't like it. <laughs> one time, I, I, there was a, there's a friendly acquaintance of mine who worked at my bank. I walked in, he goes, oh, I read, I, read, I, I went out and bought that Depeche Mode album after you rev- reviewed it. And I didn't say it, to, I didn't tell him, but I thought to myself, well... I must have done my fucking job that day because I don't really care for that album very much. But he was sufficiently piqued in his curiosity that something about it would interest him. And then he said he liked it. I've heard this idea bandied about that we're not commercials for, for, for musicians. And, and, and musicians have thanked me for, for, for being harsh and critical. I don't know. You should have to do something first before you're a school teacher about it. Before you act like a school teacher with your ruler handing out demerits and red red marking people's papers, shouldn't you? Shouldn't you at least be engaged in a creative pursuit? That's the thing. So so I say I make art about art. There are tons of writers who make art about art too. The writing itself, especially on Pitchfork. The standard was, from a certain point onwards, very high. I think the original standard was kind of demented and quirky, but that's what was part of its appeal. But once I even, like, sniffed the opportunity to write for them, it was, you knew that you had to up your game. And I'll point to two reviews in particular. There's a review by a one-time staffer who then started writing Her name's Quinn Lawrence, and she wrote, she did a review on uh, George Harrison's concert for Bangladesh. That usurped my favorite review ever. Once I read that, I was like, wow. I had one favorite review written by Chicago Tribune, Sound Opinions uh, critic, Greg Cott, the only person who identifies as a critic who I'm genuinely a fan of. But I read Quinn Lawrence's review, and I was completely blown away. That review is like a symphony. It's got that much composition uh, that much sweep it's just so there's there's just so much to it it's so grand i can't even find a word there's also a review by uh one time i think is i think he was the executive editor mark richardson wrote a review on uh, a wilco rarities box set that i thought was was outstanding and that's just two examples a lot of these people can write circles around me and i'm not just saying that uh, to be falsely modest. Like, I understand what it is when people respond positively to my reviews. I understand what it is they're responding to. And I'm cool with that. I, I, I accept that. I actually recognize when they say that. I, I take a lot of pride in it. But it's not because my flow as a, as a, it's not because my prose is so, so smooth. It's not. And so I've read things on Pitchfork that I'm like, man, If I ever could even get to that level of writing skill, I would have to practice and I don't even know that I would ever get there. There's a lot of that on the site and there are a lot of amazing writers. So when I say I make art about art, 
It's not because other people cannot make art. They are making art, and in their own view, I think they look at it that way, but their intentions are completely at odds with mine. I don't feel they are using the writing platform artfully or um, um, mindfully. Sociopolitically, I also don't want to bang a drum. I like to unpack ideas from the perspective that you may not be in alignment with me on where I'm coming from. So I'm like, is this idea? Bup, bup, bup. It also works in reverse. If I'm interviewing you and and you and I are in alignment on, on a lot of our views, you wouldn't know it from the way I approach the, asking you questions. You might even feel like you're being cross-examined and challenged and feel like, wait, I thought this person... Right, like, because I think it's more useful. I, I don't think it serves the uh, kind of extraction of understanding and to sort of stir ideas around. I don't think it serves that process to speak completely from your own perspective at the expense of other perspective you might gain from stepping out of that. So when I interview bands that I'm a really big fan of, <clears throat> unless they know that already, they won't know right away that they're talking to someone who really loves what they do. I don't like to approach people that way. There's a, a Bandcamp feature I did fairly recently. I think it was 2021. On the New Zealand metal band Alien Weaponry. The members of this band are all of Maori descent. And they sing in Maori a lot of the time. And I, I just thought, I, lo I love the music. And I just thought it was a super interesting story. That piece is a really good barometer of how I like to get ideas across. I don't like to proselytize, if that's even the correct pronunciation of that word. And it's, it's screamingly obvious to me that music journalism has become a place where only one perspective can get through. I never felt limited in being able to say what I need to say because I'm much more buttoned up when I'm writing in a formal setting. But I am disturbed by what I've seen music journalism become. And this is more for the benefit of everybody who works in music journalism who might be feeling similar things and might be feeling similarly constrained and feels hesitant to say anything. So my decision to speak is not from a place of being disgruntled. I've never been mistreated by any editors, not even one time. I had one issue at Pitchfork where one of the editors kept pushing me to, I was, I wrote a review of this band Couch Slut, this like noise metal band, super abrasive, really, really cool, interesting stuff where the front woman in one of the songs depicts a, a, a rape scenario. And then at the end, there's a line, and I liked it. And, you know, something like this can't be processed in this, um, the machinery of music journalism as it stands now, without having to be converted into a talking point or 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 a um the basis to make to 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 lobby for a particular viewpoint i wasn't sure where the the artist was coming from to me that sounded murky it sounded like a window into some of the darkness that resides within women and their sexual whole world it wasn't a didactic statement. It wasn't like wearing the, the patch of a certain very particular, very dogmatic iteration of feminism on its sleeve. Now, if I'm misrepresenting the artists, my apologies. But, but what I will say is that song is not obvious to me where it's coming from. And the editor there kept wanting me to inject moral outrage into my description of the music. And I'm like, well, 
we don't need to put more spin on this. We don't need to put more hot sauce. It's fucking right there. Right? Like, like this song is what it is. Anybody can listen to that and go, oh, that's horrible. Why do you need me to lead you by the nose to go, that's horrible, isn't it? And I haven't looked at the review in a while, but she sort of, the editor sort of got her way. There was some compromise. I remember there being some, like I pushed back and she yielded a little bit and, and, but, but there was still, I felt like that was inserted. That was the only time, the only time. There was another time with another editor at another publication more recently where I reviewed the new Metallica album and, um, this editor who's white and I don't want to, I don't want to beat, beat him up because from what I can tell, you know, decent guy, good guy trying to do the right thing. I was talking about Metallica's like towering, humongous popularity above every other metal band ever. And, um, he wrote me a note and said, well, we have to account for white privilege being, <laughs> being part of that. And, I was like, first of all, um, I'm not white. Second, so I don't feel a need to inject that. Second, two of the members of Metallica are not white. Third, if you go anywhere in the world where, you know, where non-white metal heads, which is like every continent, every inhabited continent on earth now has people who love metal the majority of them don't give a fuck about they don't see this as an incursion of whiteness into their culture maybe some of their parents do maybe some of them see it as a western pop thing but that's like you're inserting that where it doesn't belong and really it's not as if metallica took that from anyone else right it's not like there were a bunch of bands i mean you could say bad brains but that's here not even really applicable. It's not like Metallica rode the backs of black musicians to get to where they were. So, and there's plenty, 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 plenty. Everybody else basically in metal who is white can't touch Metallica in terms of their popularity. So this, why are we looking for this? Got an email back abruptly saying oh yeah never mind i i talked to somebody about this and and it, it, you know after talking to somebody about it it seems like yeah it, it doesn't really apply here and podcast host and uh, my friend james brown who hosts the podcast media studies in fact there's a new episode where i'm talking about this with him he said to me it sounds like it sounds like that guy went up the chain and because you said you stood your ground and said, I'm not white. They got freaked out and were like, okay, don't, don't push it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And that's not to cast dispersions at this publication. I love this publication. I love it. I have loved writing for them. Um, the publisher there, who I won't mention by name, because I don't want to bring heat on people. I, I know I just mentioned certain people by name. But... Um, you know, I don't want to put people in a position to be like, uh, I have to answer for Sabby now. And, and yeah, we were working with him, but we didn't know he had all these views. I don't, I don't, I don't want to cause anybody a headache like that. But I've loved working for this person. In spite of a lot of what I'm about to say. Um, so, okay. So you have some sense of where I'm coming from. I am also quite obviously racially mixed. I am half Puerto Rican. I grew up in a Puerto Rican and black neighborhood in the South Bronx. I went to a private school with mostly rich white kids. So every day, five days a week during the school year, from fourth grade through my senior year in high school, I was going from this one world to this other world every day, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is important because this has given me a sense of layering. I see race relations 
from a particular, what I would call a vantage point that does not, like, like the current race discourse does not map onto. It is impossible for me to see the way race is being, um, I guess, advocated for. It is impossible for me to reconcile that with what I have observed of people with my own two eyes. So that's important. Also, it is impossible for me to accept the, what I call, collapsification of all, I mean, all black people, all people we would refer to as black, and to ascribe certain traits to what we now refer to as blackness. I find this to be unacceptable, objectifying, and dehumanizing. I also find this to be an extension, oddly, paradoxically, kind of a reviving of a form of race essentialism that is straight out of the 1500s period of European colonialism. So a lot of what is now presenting itself as quote-unquote anti-racism, quote-unquote race consciousness, quote-unquote critical race theory, quote-unquote inclusion, quote-unquote wokeness, although wokeness is now used as a pejorative, but people who would have initially referred to themselves as woke or conscious of race I feel are inadvertently, unbeknownst to them, pushing a bizarrely neo-colonialist view of the world. To lump black people and blackness into one silo is just outrageously reductionist. We're talking about An infinite array of cultures, languages, tribal affiliations in in the case where that's the case, ethnic groups, historical and political circumstances, national uh, um, um, structures, different histories, and to then say that this is just black. And to encourage white people to walk into every interaction and have all these projected assumptions about blackness is frankly disgusting. And to then have this be rigidly enforced, I find, as a quote-unquote person of color, unacceptable. I don't care about being patronized, to be honest. It doesn't bother me. If somebody talks down to me, that's on them. It doesn't affect how I view I mean, most of the time. That's not to paint it out like I have ironclad confidence. I don't. I can walk into a situation and be very easily thrown off and feel even like intimidated. Right? But like one thing that uh, I guess I'm just blessed tends not to bother me 99% of the time is being condescended to. I don't care. (laughs) Like I don't, a lot of times don't even recognize when I'm being condescended to because in order for condescension to work, I have to buy into the idea that I'm in a lower position for you to even be talking down to me. And when you do that, I just think you're being an idiot or don't understand who you're talking to. So now this is coming from somebody who is roundly, I am very often accused of being condescending, whatever. That's, I can see it and I can also shrug my shoulders. Tough shit. Same time. Um, so, so, so you've got blackness all just this, 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 this infinite continuum of different identities. This massive mosaic that if you, you know, you could, you could literally envelop the the globe 
with if you were like sewing a blank knitting a blanket of all these different things it would cover the globe that's what we should be thinking when we think of blackness we shouldn't be reverting to race essentialism where you've got people who are supposedly speaking on behalf of black people saying things like we shouldn't expect black students to be on time because their culture doesn't value mathematical rigidity like i i and i kind of understand even where that's coming from that that's not completely out of nowhere right but it's basically the same as the people saying there's a correlation between race and IQ. Like, let's think about this for a moment. That so much of what is being put forth on behalf of certain groups has components of what is seemingly the opposite and very degrading point of view. So that's bad enough with black people, quote unquote, black people. If you listen to uh, Camille Foster, he doesn't acknowledge blackness. Now, you can laugh or say that's outrageous, but I would suggest you hear him out. I, I'm not, I'm not on board, like completely on board with that, but I, I appreciate what he's saying. Co-host of the Fifth Estate, or the Fifth Column, excuse me. Um, when you put everybody else <laughs> who's non-white into this silo, when you it's like it's like, okay, this is silo is getting pretty fucking crowded. I like all we're doing is reinforcing whiteness at the center of the universe. It's like the white gaze is what matters. And this is just it's just like colonialism 2.0. Right. And what this does is this robs us of being able to speak to people of different groups as if they're human beings, as if they're capable of injustice, of hurting other people, of being wrong, of um, being evil, of being stupid, <laughs> um, of, of just being cruel, of, of being foolish of being uh, acting from avarice or hubris. I, that's just not what I've seen. It's just not what I've seen. Now, what has happened, because I know people are going to hear this and go, oh man, this guy is apologizing for white supremacists. I know people are going to fucking just default to that. They're going to be like, man, you sound like a Republican. And this is no offense to Republicans, if that's where you're coming from, or conservatives. Um, that's not where I'm coming from. In fact, I think America in particular has an enormous amount of work in healing from the sheer brutality and sadism, the viciousness of our past with, with respect to race. So I do. I'm on board with the Howard Zins and the the the, the James Lowens of of you know um, historians who paint a picture of the United States and don't pull punches on whose blood was shed. However, I am also <laughs> on board with people who challenge that perspective because for me. From a historian's view, set aside your emotional response to someone like Thomas Sowell, who is routinely called all these things. Just roundly, like, like, like viscerally rejected. Just look at his points about history, right? I'm a hard left when it comes to economics. I couldn't be further from his view on economics, but I appreciate his voice. We are now in an intellectual and spe more specifically a media and pop culture music criticism climate where these ideas cannot be explored. Where the, the subtle distinctions between different populations 
cannot be explored, where there is a language of victimization that has become almost a religious code emanating from educated, upper-middle-class, white society being filtered down. Along with this, we have a brand of feminism that is very keen on perpetually um, removing agency from women. If you buy into this brand of feminism, you are always seeing yourself at the mercy of someone else's power relative to your lack of power. Again, there's a paradox here because you listen to this and it's like, this is actually Victorian era patriarchy repackaged as something else. This is women are pure, right? Much as I was saying before that this is like colonialism, white progressives are now being trained to view people of color as this kind of noble savage, incapable of the full range of human emotion. Only white people have agency. Similarly, the white women pushing this brand of feminism, and some of them have been editors of mine, this is where this gets sticky, are pushing this idea that only men have agency. Doesn't map on to circumstance. It just doesn't, as far as I'm concerned. And I should be able to, as should anyone else, voice my skepticism or my outright refusal of these principles in my music writing. But instead, they've been replaced by mantras. Believe accusers. Black trans lives matter. Uh, trans rights are women's rights. Stop fascism. That's another one. I haven't even gotten into the political side of the picture. So music journalism has become a haven for this idea that there are good people. And then there's opponents of goodness. It's a very bifurcated black and white world. In fact... It echoes a lot of um, BPD thinking, borderline personality disorder, disordered type thinking. I don't love the BPD label to be putting on people. Sometimes I've thought it's a useful model to be like, hmm, that could be me. But this, this splitting of the world into black, white, good, bad. You're on, you're with us or you're against us. This has overtaken music journalism largely at the hands of people who mean well who I have enjoyed working with pushing ideas that I am fundamentally opposed to I cannot abide by any view of people that pushes simplicity with such aggressive fervor I can't I'm drawn to complexity I love complicated things. I think people are complicated. I think groups of people and the way they interact, those dynamics, they're messy. They're, they're deliciously complicated. I love sinking my teeth. It's like having a sandwich this high. It's like, ah, like, like I could be sinking my teeth into, <laughs> into, like reflecting on these things and just feel like I'm sinking and sinking and sinking. This is antithetical to what is being pushed. And what am I getting at here? Pitchfork, in my experience, as it played out, like the way I became aware of it, was one of the um, leading voices in bringing this kind of reductive us versus them ideologically dogmatic very narrow view they they planted the seeds and this spread to the rest of music journalism and to uh, 
uh, entertainment media and media more generally. This started somewhere around between 2012 and 2014. And now we're in a circumstance where if I just talk to one of my friends, this, this kind of lexicon of these views, oh, what is gender anyway? Um, white privilege, that's another one, right? These are now accepted as just inalienable facts of life. These, these, these linguistic devices are meant to get you to kind of get yourself into a stupor where you're not actually using your critical thinking faculties. That's what those phrases are meant for. They worm their way through repetition into disabling you from seeing the contradictions and just how inadequate those phrases are. They lull you into a state of thinking you can sort of sloganeer your way through life and all your answers are there for you. There's white, cis, hetero, imperialism, oppression, and everything funnels from there. Wow. Um, I, <laughs> not to me, it doesn't. <clears throat> and um, I can't accept that. And I can't accept music critics installing themselves as the enforcers of this code as if they are like the Saudi Arabian religious police. Now that may seem like a like overtly provocative example. If you're watching this and you are a music critic or an editor who has been on board with a lot of these ideas, you're like you're probably like, "Oh, okay, okay, okay." Dude, what are you talking about? But I'm not just saying that for effect. I'm not just comparing the music journalism establishment to the Cultural Revolution, or even worse, to the Khmer Rouge, just to rile people up. You have to understand. In fact, I am imploring you, I am pleading with you to understand what we have unleashed and what role music critics have played in unleashing these forces that, as far as I'm concerned, are extremely poisonous and destructive. It's not like I'm blaming music critics. I'm saying music critics have been instruments, have allowed themselves to be vehicles or vectors of a certain ideological, viral way of not thinking but reflexively responding to a complex world. And it has to stop. In fact, the Pitchfork GQ merger is a harbinger of the fact that the culture war is now entering a new phase and that music critics are likely about to find themselves on the outs. The barbarians, as y'all see them, the barbarians are at the gate. They are clanging on the castle walls. The castle has been sacked. And you can approach this, you can respond with some grace and humility and some introspection, or you can double down and just feel like you're being attacked and you need to even be go harder. In which case, I think it's not going to work out very well for you. These kinds of regime changes happen all the time in history. And it's not pretty. <laughs> but you have a group of people in music critics who, who staged a coup around 2014 or so. Who said, we're in charge now. And they thought it was their divine right to start engaging in this public execution campaign. They thought that on behalf of women on behalf of um, whatever, they had to out abusers and racists. And this spread like a fire. And they kept telling us that this was being done for a righteous cause. Blissfully ignorant, blithely and conveniently unaware 
of the passions they were stirring up in people. Is it fair for me to say that music critics have become demagogues? Yes, I think it's true. That's what I think. Is that going to be hurtful and is it going to be received well? Probably not. I guess the way to put it is, can you serve a different purpose than being a demagogue? The feeling of people mobilizing together to eradicate impurities from their community, to punish wrongdoers, is about the most, the lowest vibrational instinct we as people have. We are dependent on group coexistence. We need the group to survive. We have always been that way, and we are so dependent that to be banished from the group instinctually feels like a certain death. It feels actually worse than death. And so this desire to reinforce social codes and say, you're going to do this or else face the ultimate consequence is not coming from a good place. It's not coming from a place of wanting to help people. It's coming from a place of you being afraid of what's in your own soul. And I am making sure to say this at the camera. If you're out there on the hunt, hyper vigilant, about making sure other people get exposed for their misdeeds, what's unfortunately happening is that you are unaware of what's in you. And I guarantee you that if you were to sit and have to look at your life, you would see things that you just couldn't accept. This is coming from a place of self-rejection, of self-recrimination. And music should not be the weapon of choice, the cudgel to advance not only this worldview, but this climate of turning people against each other, of acting as if we must all behave like the East German Stasi secret police, turning in our neighbors, our family, the people we love. Ah, but here come the cries of cancel culture is a myth and nobody gets canceled. Dave Chappelle gets to, could to continue doing his comedy. I just had a, an awesome conversation with a music writer who's on board with a lot of these things that I'm opposed to. And we had an awesome chat and I don't want to alienate people like that. I want to re, um, re sew back together our fragmented social bonds. I think this is hugely important. In fact, I feel a very strong sense of mission that we must heal our social bonds. We have to heal people internally. Even the ones who do things that we look at as like objectively horrible. And the stone throwers need to be healed too. Now, I have an issue with music critics and editors being empowered to be our conscience, to operate as a kind of caliphate issuing holy decrees and when they feel like it fatwas against people like demanding the heads of certain people i have an issue with the music journalism industrial complex being used to incite this bloodlust for a pound of flesh i am asking you all to take a step back look at the look at the past decade just look what we've become, just more broadly. Look at the fever pitch we're in. Okay, fine, maybe you didn't create these circumstances, but our voices have been mobilized to reinforce and to exacerbate the circumstances we're in. We're in trouble. It is shocking to me. <laughs> 
that the USA has held together over the last eight years or so. And it's not looking good. I'm not a hope, uh, I'm not a hopelessness addict. But I mean, we've got some fucking serious like this is a we're in a we're navigating a very treacherous moment in our history as a society. And you can't keep coming to this to a fire with gasoline in your hands. And then acting as if you're the ones on the noble crusade. This this has to stop. Now, I should also mention I've never identified as a critic. I've never wanted to be a critic. I write about music. I yes, I do offer criticisms. Yes, my opinion makes itself evident in my reviews. But I have always seen my reviews as something you can walk around to get to what you would think of the music based on my descriptions. I challenge artists' intentions all the time. My first two pieces for Pitchfork, actually, one was on a grindcore band named Cretan uh, with a trans front woman. And before Marissa Martinez Hoadley had gender reassignment surgery, she was Mike Martinez. And they were singing about stuff with a bunch of like sexually violent overtones. I love that band. I thought, man, this is such an interesting story. This was in December of 2014. I really value Marissa's perspective. But this is the thing. Because you care about people, our sense of being polite and caring about people has been leveraged against us to accept things that are, at the very least begging to be examined or challenged right i mean very similar to what i said before the whole trans rights issue it's like okay we're being told gender is fluid but again through a rigid gender essentialist outlook straight out of the 1950s like straight out of gender roles that are super traditional and then we're telling kids well if you want to play with dolls you might as well be a woman from this sitcom from 1962. Right? There are inconsistencies here. And I think people like Katie Herzog and detransitioners should be listened to and have a place at the table. I think there's a huge diversity of outlook and voices among trans people. If you were to get 50 trans people in a room, you would hear them say things that our current media regime would not allow to be discussed openly, which is really weird. You get this seizure, people's voices being removed. Oh, you're a black conservative, or even not even a black conservative, so a black heterodox thinker who doesn't fit these boxes, then you're not really black. And who is it driving this the most aggressively? It's white people in publishing. Why are we giving this much power? Right. I never wanted to make value judgments on art and in fact don't. I never wanted to speak from an objective absolutist point of view on music. As far as I'm concerned, your views on music are what they are. I am not deciding as a member of a council where you should be relative to the consensus. I think music critics manufacture consensus around art. And I think that is horseshit. And I've heard a lot of people defend this. That we need curators. We need somebody to, to be our tastemakers. No, we fucking don't. You don't need me. And I'm not even claiming to be a tastemaker. I'm not even taking that on myself. If you love Insane Clown Posse, that's, knock yourself out. And I want to be able to write to you so that you can relate. If you hate Insane Clown Posse and you think they suck, I want to be able to write to you as well. I don't have to like something to write about it. My criteria was as long as I feel I can say something about it or be able to get up to speed enough on like the, the artist's background and story and where they fit in. If I didn't think I could do that, I'd be like, no. 
if I didn't think I could catch up, but there's tons of stuff I wrote about that I had no knowledge of whatsoever prior to writing about it. And I wanted to make sure that fans of that artist, that, that it would stand up for them, that it would stand up to people who did know a lot. Because I'm fucking curious. Like, I, I'm curious about a lot of shit. I, I, it's like you throw something in front of me and I'm like, hmm, that looks interesting. I'm going to jump right on, right on top of it. So I don't have to, I'm not writing <laughs> strictly from the perspective of like, I want you, I want to convert you to what I like. Now there's obviously music I love that I would shout from the rooftops for people to try to hear. But even then, I try to take a little bit of remove from it. I've never written about Jane's Addiction. It would be very hard for me to do that because I love them so much. My reviews should make sense to you whether you agree with me or not. There is no absolute truth about music. I understand why people constantly reference them, their own experience against the group. I understand why they do that. Because music is so transcendent that you want to feel like other people share this with you. But you don't need to keep listening against, well, uh, I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people start conversations like deep listeners, musicians. Oh, I know people didn't like this album, but I like it. I know this wasn't recognized. I know this isn't one of their popular. It's like, why do you care? You're not sitting at a fucking lunch table in junior high. Self-conscious because you decided to do something the herd didn't do. It doesn't matter. What everyone, quote unquote, or people have decided about the music you love. It doesn't matter. Why are you checking your own experience against this invisible group of straw people in your head? I know why. Because critics play on that. They play on your need to belong. They play on the idea that they are the ones that somehow have... Some special quality that, you know, nobody gave them. Some special appointment to decide for you what the meaning of the music you are experiencing is. And why is this? Because they have knowledge. What the fuck does knowledge have to do with music? Because they, they have this air of erudition about them. And you're supposed to listen to these people? No. I write from a perspective that it is your experience that is paramount and that is at the center. Who decided that a small cluster of people who, by the way, mostly don't make music themselves, and that's important because I do, and mention that, that's, that's important, to then pass judgment on the creativity of others who decided that there should be jobs where you can profit off the labor of others and i use that language on purpose because there's so much talk among music critics today about power and power imbalance and they act as if the artists have all the power over them no 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 you got it backwards this is a sleight of hand you're pulling on yourself. You have the power. You have the power to write someone's story. You have the power to be the filter that dictates how a certain artist's work is understood. And now, on top of that, as if that wasn't bad enough, right? I would have been saying these things, but I would have been saying them to like three people who care. To my friends who've heard me say this over and over and over. Like, okay, oh my God, oh my God. Okay, yeah, there he goes again. Just let him go off in the corner and mutter to himself. Right? I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is I would have been able to say things without attacking critics. I would have been able to just say, hey, you, the audience, let's center this back to your own sensory perception. Why do you need to gaslight yourself? And cast doubt on your experience with music. 
You don't need anyone else to intervene. In fact, they don't belong there. Okay, fine. A dozen people <laughs> would have been like, oh, great. Right. But now, once this shift happened around 2014, it's gone a step further. Now it's gone from sort of an aesthetic <laughs> um, debate, you know, a bone of contention of Sabby's that Sabby's been chewing on forever, purely in the aesthetic arena, right? Now it's gone into the realm of the grotesque. Now it's gone into the realm of socially irresponsible. Now it's gone into the realm of actual violence. Now it has advanced into the realm of mob vigilante justice. Now it has advanced into ideological tyranny. Again, let's not make any assumptions. I am not your stereotypical, I'm not even red-pilled. I'm not right-wing, although I have come to appreciate aspects of a conservative slash right-wing perspective, and I think that we need to have a holistic understanding, and we need to kind of recede a little bit from, or withdraw somewhat from this left-right dichotomy, and I think both have values that they share and don't know it, and I also think their values that are in opposition to one another complement each other and can work together. That's what I think. However, I'm a lifelong leftist. So when I hear a lot of people going on and on about the left, the left, the left, the left, the left, what I want to say to them is, what is being presented as leftist ideology today is a perversion, is a hijacking, is a strange mutation <laughs> of leftist progressive ideals into something that is tripped out into kind of a monster. Into something that actively promotes the opposite of progress. Into something that is still laden down with puritanical, like distinctly American Puritan uh, hangups. There's a sense of purity of absolute moral imperative. And so music journalism has become a, prop a propaganda mill. And like an endless sounding board for one point of view. Here's the subtext. Here's what I would appeal to you to, 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 to try to bring yourself to look at. You know, Nelson Mandela talked about, after spending 27 years imprisoned in a fucking concrete room, he said, if I had come from that angry, I wouldn't have survived. I'm paraphrasing. I would ask you to consider, what does punishment do for you? Will it bring you peace? No. What does this ideal of what a good person is supposed to be, what does it bring you? What does it do for you except back you into a corner where you cannot reveal what's truly within you? Does that help you? What does pointing fingers and stoning people to death do for you? And I have had, I mean, I can point to thousands of examples. This has become standard in music criticism. It's open season on anybody who does not comply with this incredibly simplistic set of principles. There are editors, prominent music voices, like very visible commentators who have openly called for censorship, public castigation, Where does this take us? Where does this take us? And what does that infusion of power do for you? What does that do to your soul other than corrupt it? Are you really comfortable with being the enforcers 
you shouldn't be, <laughs> and you're being challenged. And the more you double down on this, the more you will become an unfortunate footnote of history. All of these regimes end up the same way. They all had a sense of divine right to seize control by any means necessary. No matter what it took, no matter who they had to fucking knock off to get there, no matter how dehumanizing it was to themselves. And all that does is breed a counter-reaction. Over time, over the last 10 years, there's been a slow creeping effect. We can't talk about music or art from anything resembling like a complex perspective. You couldn't talk about a band started by Nigerian American immigrants who leans conservative. You couldn't talk about a band with a, a Republican trans member and a detransitioner. You like all musicians are being objectified as like little hood ornaments, and they all represent the struggle of BIPOC LGBT as that struggle is told by one group of people. This is power, if I've ever seen it. And here's the thing. I may not identify as a critic. I do think wanting to be a critic is a low vibrational endeavor. I do. I do think critics profit off of other people's labor. I do think that is a parasitic relationship. I do think it is an intrusive relationship with the public. Okay, fine. Good enough. Good and fine. Who cares what I think about you? As people, that doesn't change how I view you as people. And so what? You can listen to that and go, oh, fuck you too. That's not the important part. You have now been installed as people with the power of words to dictate our moral compass, to be our moral guidance system. And I am saying to you, I cannot allow this to happen. You shouldn't want to allow this to happen in good conscience. If you were approaching social issues in good faith, you would understand they require a lot more than pat, prepackaged, mindless sloganeering. So I'm asking you to, to consider that your moment in history, your number's about to come up. What happens now? Okay. So I've heard people suggest that music critics should start a co-op model. I think that's a great idea. Why aren't we seeing more of you? I do not believe in dumb people, and I do not believe in boring people. I have never met a dumb or boring person in my life. I think stupid should be replaced with blind because I think people make choices often unbeknownst to them that are foolish, ill-considered, and self-defeating. I do not believe music critics are dumb or boring, and I think they have created... a framework of discourse that makes us all kind of have to climb into a dumbness, a fisheye tunnel view of life. Why? This is not who you are. You have a perspective. We are all unique <laughs> snowflakes. <laughs> Why is our profession set up so that we're not getting more of that from you? Why can't we have more of you? And I don't mean, I like this album. I don't think that's particularly useful. What I mean is your perspective. What you see when you look out the window. Why are you raising yourself? Well, I'm only just a, I'm, I know I'm just a white male, but don't fucking genuflect in front of me. 
Don't defer to me. Hold your fucking head up. You don't need to defer to shit. You don't owe me a fucking thing. And in fact, you don't owe it to me to pretend as if I can't handle it if you hold your own. No, you're doing me a service. When someone says to you, I don't owe it to you to, to, to slouch my back and like act like a dog with its tail between his legs. When someone says that to you, they're doing you a favor, no matter what your circumstances are. Because giving people power and leverage to say, I'm a member of a certain group, you better listen to me, is actually like a like a like a like a um a time release flesh eating virus for their self esteem it's giving them an infusion of instant power but making them dependent on your approval for them to feel like they're okay which guess what sends them on a downward spiral you're doing people a favor by just holding your own and saying well i don't see it that way I don't. And you're not going to morally beseech me by twisting my arm thinking you have leverage over me. I don't acknowledge that leverage. This is what we must start doing. Every time you find yourself in one of these interactions, and it doesn't have to be with a leftist either. It can be with somebody who's like coming from the conservative side saying God and patriotism demand. No, they don't. I don't subscribe to that. Five words. I don't subscribe to that. Let's renormalize those five words. Keep them in your back pocket, your front pocket, your side pocket. Keep them taped under your hat. I don't subscribe to that. It reminds you, or the person who's coming at you, you do not get to draw the line of where I place my what I see and what I think and feel in this circle I fucking decide that not you and music critics using their platform as a bully pulpit to beseech us to constantly browbeat us with this sense of like we are required to see things a certain way who said they were the ones? I mean, I don't tr trust anybody to do that. I don't think that's healthy at all. Why? On what qualifications? Other than that they care about people. Well, if they cared about people, they would have a better understanding of the people they're talking about. Because I will tell you, people from neighborhoods like mine don't buy into this learned helplessness that's being filtered down it's being packaged as oh you're getting respect you've got to be sensitive whenever a white person doesn't acknowledge you this is a microaggression no 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 this is reverse empowerment this is the opposite of empowerment you're being conditioned and rewarded for having a thin skin so my family on my mom's side is from puerto rico Puerto Rico is not racially homogenous. It's very, like, there's a, there's a ton of variety. So much so, it is somewhat unique in this way, although Cuba, I, from what I can tell, has a very similar sort of racial ethnic makeup. But it's very, very common in Puerto Rico, in the same family, to have really, really dark-skinned people who we would call black. Then, ranging from that all the way, like in the middle, you get what I call caramel apple uh, complexion people. <laughs> you know, that sort of stereotypical look when you think about someone from Puerto Rico. There's like swarthy skin, sort of wavy dark hair, and... um some sort of trace of the native indigenous Daino population, although 
they were mostly killed off. But it, but these people look sort of sort of some some hybrid mongrel native like combination. And then you have people who we would call white. Many of them with dark hair and brown eyes like my mom, but there were blonde people in my family and there are black people in my family. <laughs> okay? So, and then lots of combinations in between. This is, this is the way th that society is set up. And you have to understand that these divisions or these delineations don't immediately slot into the racial hierarchy or structure that, that we have here in the States. It's not the exact same thing. Yes, Puerto Rico is a post-colonial, like European-dominated, white-dominated society. That's not in dispute. But the how people see themselves is different than here. Also, what I have encountered, number one, is as much as we might, as much as you have media figures now, again, who try to push this, this narrative that black American and Latin communities are just on the same page, there's friction there. Let's put it that way. There are racial slurs actually going in both directions that me and my friends growing up Granted, this was 30 years ago, but me and my friends growing up, we heard them all the time. We heard parents of both groups use them. And, you know, we were elbow to elbow with black kids all the time. We didn't really use them, but there was a sense of even being side by side, right? Even playing tackle football on concrete, which I did not do. <laughs> um, it's like there's still this division. It wasn't entirely hostile, right? But it was there. And so you can say, well, you know, these are both impoverished groups and it's from, it's, it's because of the white hand of, 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 um, you know, the white boot pressing down on these people and they're, you know, fighting with each other. Not everybody had that experience. Like there, there has been some continuity between these groups, but it's not, what we're being shown now. We're being shown almost this like, I don't want to say utopian, uh, but there, it's like a Sesame Street version of the truth. Although Sesame Street is more clever <laughs> than this. There's, there's tension there. Um, there's also tension between black immigrants and black Americans, which this, in this climate, like, there's no room for talking about this. I would also imagine that in cities like Baltimore and Atlanta, where there's a sizable black middle and upper class, where you look down the street at those streetcars in Baltimore and you see like, like every walk of life is black, right? And you're like, whoa, this is different <laughs> than what we're accustomed to, most of us in the rest of the country are accustomed to seeing. I would imagine some of the same racial issues that we're hung up on as race issues exist in these communities as class issues. Again, drilling down, like Laura Kipnis said, I'm always looking for a more complex answer, not a less complex answer. Laura Kipnis, I highly recommend her stuff. We're being fed, like I said, junk food for the conscience. Tap your knee and then your knee goes, boop, racism, white privilege. And what that feels to me like, I don't think I've done a very good job of explaining what it was like in my neighborhood, but what that feels to me is when these outside people who come who, who like look out and all they see is skin color, a, a, a homogenous blob 
of brownness that they call people of color, they're not, by definition, seeing distinctions. They're flattening identity into one, like, yucky, featureless, like, fruit (laughs) roll-up. Just sticky, you know, there's no distinguishing taste to it. There's nothing that that sits in the fruit roll-up. It's just gel. Why is this being done? And why have white media voices been given so much authority to kind of hand this out to people, to impart this to other people, to the point where you have so many people in these groups talking about themselves with this same language because it's tempting to do that because this mode gives people a quick instant hit of oh you're important it appeals to the ego which then gets inflated but it doesn't actually address one's core sense of self-worth it's a bait and switch it's a blank credit card in a currency that immediately inflates and depreciates in value. We're capitalizing the word black. It is now considered polite and standard etiquette to defer to someone in a group and have them tut-tut you into silence. Right? And that gives someone a sense of power in an interaction, in a person-to-person interaction. What does it do for your self-esteem when you know people are agreeing with you because they have to? When you're not actually addressing arguments or points, you're using moral leverage to say, you can't think this way. And then my answer to that is, okay, well, you're a member of this group. What about this other member of this group who says the opposite? Who am I supposed to listen to then? And when you don't have that to fall back on, that, um, um, what's the word, that entreaty to, to, to um, um, when you don't have that like appeal to someone's good personhood, Then what? Then you've got to address the arguments. And every group has this this incredible variety of flavors. I want that. I am not convincible that social issues have a simple answer. That's just not ever been the way I see things. And so anything that attempts to to, to, to put these metal plates (laughs) around my head and say, no, no, this way, this way. It, It feels artificial and it feels forced. And, you know, even, even the censoring of the word nigga is, is being enforced to me. It almost feels like, um, like, like I imagine like American generals in Vietnam, like they're coming in with this massive weight behind them, not understanding the culture that they're dealing with. Well-meaning white people who view people of color as one giant mass that they need to apologize to for European colonialism are being um, they're painting with way too broad of a brush and they're making assumptions very paternalistic assumptions might I add or even maternalistic assumptions and it's it's they're they're presupposing a lack of humanness and a lack of, they're like already assuming that you're in some sort of oppressed position. A lot of people eat this up. They love being catered to this way. And I, I guess I can't blame them. There's a price to be paid for that. 
when we allow everything to be dumbed down to this degree, when we allow certain groups to be presented as noble savages who are incapable of doing harm to others. Another example, Latinx. Spanish is a gendered language. Decoupling a language from its structural foundation is an imperialist tool. This is what conquerors do. They usurp local language. This has been done all over the world. They extinguish the linguistic roots of the population they are subjugating. Most Latin communities throughout the Western Hemisphere also have a strong religious, um, I would say, backbone or, or like, a base, like a basis to their cosmological outlook, even if they themselves are not super big on religion. So making a snap decision, just like that, with a wave of a hand, to degender Spanish is an act of colonial brutality. For someone like me, who was raised speaking Spanish, I must view this as, as an act of soft warfare, as an affront to my culture. This shit is not neat and tidy. You can't just throw all black people, all people of color, all LGBTQ people, when you've got a ton of variety there too, all cultures that have been quote-unquote oppressed or are or, or the product of like post-European colonial expansion. You can't just throw this all into one <laughs> vat and make a, a smoothie of it and think you're on the right track. It's, it's it, it, like, it doesn't work. Black Americans overwhelmingly lean towards social conservatism. This is just a fact. This is irreconcilable with the, the one perspective that outlets like Pitchfork have been pushing or mm, selling us. And so we've got to be careful. We've got to reopen our eyes. The problem with this mentality that we've all been encouraged to adopt is that it gives you a sense of certainty, it gives you a sense of moral indignation and, and a, a sense of authoritativeness to be black and white, to slogan ear into areas that just will not, w won't, um, I guess, tolerate simple black and white uh, viewpoints. You can't be binary <laughs> in a world this complicated. We, we can't. And we're selling people, and not, not we, but from the perspective of music critics, filtering music through this tiny thread or this tiny needle's eye is selling a lie. No matter how comforting that lie may be, it's generating anger outside the castle walls, outside of your demographic sphere. There are lots and lots and lots of people who don't see the world this way. We have to find a way to not keep viewing each other as some kind of existential threat. We must stop using this inflammatory, exclusionary language, this, this cultish like uh, religiosic blackmail. Oh, if you wander too far 
away from our scriptures, you're going to have to face the world by yourself. You need us. You need this scripture. This is what's, this is the energy that's coming across from music reviews. And it has been for over a decade. And the thing, again, with a lot of these people, they mean well. And because there's a certain sort of stereotypical stripe of American progressive that is secular in their viewpoints and, and you know, I, I could sort of check off a list of boxes of viewpoints, right? Like pro-abortion, uh, pro-immigration, probably pro-Ukraine war, depending on where. I mean, like far leftists, probably not. But... Um, pro-COVID measures and pro-COVID vaccines and so on and so on and so on and so on. Pro-DEI. Anti-Trump, right? That's, that's just a handful. That's not even the more... That's not even a very sophisticated uh, rendering of that package of ideals. But it's like to be on Team Blue, you have a package. And typically... If we're, if we're, again, painting with a broad brush, there's a secular leaning in this, in this outlook. And people who aren't raised religious often don't see when those kinds of weapons of control are being aimed at them. When you're being spiritually blackmailed into adhering and becoming an adherent of a dogma, this has been happening to a frightening degree this entire time. And so we have to ask ourselves why would a publisher like Conde Nast? have bought this media platform that was a leading voice in spreading this kind of reductionist view of our world, of our lives. Why? I don't know. I don't have the answer. And what do we think they expected to get out of it? And why should we have expected that they would be loyal to us, for what? Why was this a given that you should have a job commentating on people's creativity and have, number one, the license to judge that creativity, the license to choose who does and doesn't get covered, because that's important, as much as we're talking about, oh, there's nobody to champion Lesser known artists, well, how many lesser known artists have been left out up until this point? Because people who installed themselves as tastemakers in uh, media positions either decided or just by circumstance overlooked these other people. Are you really advocating for the little? Musician for the independent, or are you having a spasm of concern that the structure around you is changing that you, so that you don't have as much power as you once did? Do you even recognize yourself as having that power? Are you in your own um, thoughts fighting this bigger? monster that you've lost sight of who and where you are in this whole picture too to all music critics i would say you have a ton of power over artists and i have heard very little very very little in fact almost zero recognition um, reflection 
on that power. There's one person I've ever met who has written about music and he's more of a musician. He's, he's actually a musician first and he gets it. <laughs> Everybody else I've talked to about this, they get real upset when you even so much as challenge the idea. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Why well, do you have this authority? Like, like, what is it that gave that to you? Well, 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 you know, we need curators and we need people to evaluate music, do we? Because we all have fucking ears. Um, <laughs> like, and the sound goes to my ears. Provokes a response in my brain. I feel something. I can have that experience. What do listeners need you for exactly? What exactly is it that you're bringing to the table? I know you're passionate about music. I know you care. But are you throwing your weight around in a way that is conscientious as you focus on all these bigger problems? Is it not the case that with the power of the pen or the keyboard, you have played kingmaker in the realm of art. Have you used that power gracefully, conscientiously, and humanely? Ask Travis Morrison of the Dismemberment Plan about what happened to his career when Pitchfork gave him a 0.0 review. You know, this was before the whole Condé Nast thing. Pitchfork grew out of a blog of super passionate music snobs and music geeks. At the time when the blog was on its ascendance as uh, like a um, uh, as a driver of culture. This was in the early 2000s or late 90s, early 2000s when everything was changing. And then it was on its way to becoming a more, I guess, respectable media platform by the time Condé Nast took it over. Now, I have also heard people just sort of shrug or, or disparage Pitchfork, saying, eh, they just became corporate anyway and they were co covering more corporate music. I actually don't think that's very fair because I still saw a lot of like underground, left-of-center stuff that was being covered. What I think happened at that time was like the, the optimism thing, you know, and again, I'm, I may have my, I'm, I'm fuzzy on exactly what the timeline is. I think there was an infusion of more of that, right? It was sort of like the simultaneous mainstreaming of, um, all that energy from the blogosphere and then the kind of um, elevating pop culture, what what's basically would have been like entertainment weekly level subjects, pop stars like Taylor Swift, in, injecting this sense of like importance into those discussions. And conducting them from a really academic perspective, right? Like sort of fooling or, or like taking the tone and attitude of the blog writers who are themselves snobs <laughs> and then saying, oh, no, 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 you're journalists now. But then also taking sort of like pop culture, I don't know, just junk food and giving those bloggy music snobs a sense of no, 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 no. We're talking about this in terms that you understand, like on these, in this really sort of edgy kind of way. And, and I mean, I'm, there's been some excellent writing about it, but the way we talk about Taylor Swift today is largely determined by the way this circle of people decided to confer importance on Taylor Swift, whether you like it or not. 
And if you don't, you must be somebody who is clearly biased and coming from a misogynistic perspective. And if she were a man, you wouldn't feel this way. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have your, your boxer shorts in a bunch. That kind of Kafka trap where, wait, wait, wait. I see something going on here. Oh, but if you even point it out, it must be because you are on the other side of this fence and therefore coming from a poisonous perspective. So you're again browbeaten into compliance. And this happens in this very, um, to get from doing that about music to then doing that about our discussions on these much bigger issues, it's just one blur. It's, it's a very smooth, blurry motion to get there. So where are we now? What are we going to see as music journalists can hopefully create more platforms for themselves? Because we're not going to stop talking about music. I mean, people generally, there's a place for you somewhere. Where is it? How can you find the people who want your voice? And can you give us your voice now that you're free of this larger um, corporate structure that maybe was holding you back more than you think? I will leave you with this. There was a, an infamous black jazz critic named Stanley Crouch. Crouch rhymes with grouch. And he was notoriously acerbic. He was very critical of hip-hop. In today's media landscape, he would undoubtedly be sort of forced into, you know, he'd be, he'd be tagged as like a conservative or, you know, somebody pushing quote-unquote respectability politics, which I don't think would be fair. He, um, <laughs> he worked at the Village Voice, and he was actually a failed free jazz musician. There was an incident once where he punched a co-worker, the Village Voice, for suggesting that the classic Public Enemy album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, was on par with Coltrane. No, I'm actually with that other writer. I agree with that. Crouch was so offended by this. He punched the guy. I don't know how much longer he lasted at the Village Voice, but there are some cool stories written about him after he died. Super interesting character. There wouldn't be a place for a Stanley Crouch today. You could not be Stanley Crouch, which means white publishers have defined what blackness is. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. We've got to be done with this. We've got to let people be what they are in all their glory, in all their complexity, in all their messiness, in all their yuckiness. And that includes you too, music critics. You're not m morally pure. You're not pure of spirit. Who are you to be nailing people to crosses? This must be asked of you. As much as I care for y'all, particularly my editors that I've worked with. Who are you to be turning the world into a fucking killing field? Yeah, I'm comparing you to the Khmer Rouge. Look how things turned out for them. Look at the psychic crater that that left on that society. With a bunch of fucking skulls. That you and I could, could get a plane ticket and go visit right now. There are skulls. This desire to eradicate what we don't like. It isn't just coming from the left. I haven't even gotten into that. Conservatives have their delusions too. And their paradoxes. But I'm specifically talking about music critics. Because there isn't a parallel of Pitchfork on the right. They're, they just haven't jumped into that arena for some reason and like what is this doing for us I'm asking you to take a long hard look in the mirror and then I'm telling you if you're not inclined to do that 
the wheel of history is turning right before your very eyes. And I think y'all can sense it. I think the response of, oh my God, to the pitchfork thing, I think there's a feeling of anxiety in the air. The barbarians are at the gate. They have just sacked one of your castles, GQ of all places, now (laughs) is in charge of pitchfork. There's an irony there. History is cruel with bitter, bloody ironies. Take stock of where you're at. You have been talking out onto out your window to a country that does not buy what most most of the people in it don't agree with where you're at. They don't buy what you're selling them. You've you've been inside an echo chamber and things are about to change. I don't want to say most people. There is a huge segment of the population of the country you live in that is not part of the choir you're preaching to. Does that not give you some moment to pause? Can you try to relate? Can you try to speak from a place where you are not comfortable in your sense of absolute truth? Can you try? I'm a member of uh, a private Facebook music journalist group. Um, Needless to say, my viewpoints are not super popular on there. And um, one of the members of that group, she talked about how I think she interned at the Village Voice back in the in the, the heyday. She said there were fights, like heated arguments among staff people about issues. And it's like, why can't we get back to that? You are not boring. You are not. No music critic, no person is meant to just parrot whatever is socially expedient to say in that moment to save their ass. There's more to you than this. You're not boring. (laughs) You have a perspective. If you're going to sound off on music, give us your fucking perspective. Come from where you're coming from. It's okay. Like, give yourself a little bit more wiggle room. You're not a parrot. That's why you were born a person. With a brain and a mouth that work. You can live as a parrot and it sucks. And it's not who you are. It's not authentic to who and what you are. You have too much depth. You have too much experience. No one sees the world quite the way you do. We are all the better for you letting us in on that. And listen, the things that are expected of us to say, these slogans, these mindless phrases, those are about to change. (laughs) And then what are you going to do? You're just going to go along with whatever was there? It's going to be on the record what you said the last time. There are pockets of understanding that you innately have within you that don't Um, that don't fit into this rigid black and white splitting. There's more to you than this. I am hoping that Pitchfork being absorbed into GQ is a step in the right direction. Not like, oh, you know, let Pitchfork rot and, and it's a great thing that they're done. I mean, I know my tweets came off that way. But it's more about What can this usher in for expression among the people who love music so much that they feel the need to write about it? I know I said I view music critics as as parasites, but the one thing we share is that we fucking love music. They don't see themselves that way. They see themselves as serving, doing a public service. Okay, I don't agree with it, but fine. I'll grant you that. Then do the public service. Don't just be a soldier. How about you be a person? All right? 